All right, so there we go. There's number seven. So the plan for today is to finish 2-1. <laughs> it says and 2-2. Two, two. I, 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 I don't think so. We'll finish 2-1, for sure 2-1. All right, homework was due a few minutes ago for 1.3, right? It was due. It's always due at class time when we finish something. So 1.3. I just sent you out an email, maybe too little, too late just like about an hour ago, if you were having any trouble with the graphing calculator. Did you guys figure that out, how to use the graphing calculator to solve equations? So if you had trouble, you can always go, you can do late homework. You know, one or two problems done late, even every section, if you just do one or two or three late because you couldn't quite figure it out before the due date and you come to class, you grab me afterwards or I explain something in class and you go back after the due date and do one or two, that won't even affect your grade 1%. It's, it's designed to have a little leeway. You know what I mean? Late homework's half credit. Late homework's half credit. If you're just doing, the, all the whole homework area is only 50 points. So if you're just doing one or two or even three problems on each section after the deadline, even four probably, that's, that's nothing. That won't even be 1% of your grade. So don't worry, like if there's one or two that are hard, you couldn't get anyone away. So I sent you that email if you had trouble. Check that out, I sent you a YouTube that's really a nice one where they just show really clearly how to use the TI to, to solve equations with the graphing calculator using the intersect thing that I did. It's really easy. If you have a Casio, you can go on and find a YouTube for that as well. Or grab me after class. I'd be glad to help. Okay, we're in 2 1. We're solving. Uh, we've been talking about whether something's a function or not. Remember that? That was the deal. Remember the definition of a function? What's the definition of a function? Yeah, every input, only one output. Goes to only one output, right? And we talked about that. So now, we're gonna, we saw that with like the arrow diagrams. We saw how to determine if that was true or false. And then we looked at the, um, the sets of points, right? X, Y, X, Y, X, Y, like graphing points, you know, ordered points. Now we're going to say, what about equations? How do you look at an equation? So every input, every x is supposed to go to only one y. How do you look at an equation, like y equals you know, 2x cubed, and decide whether that thing is going to be a function or not? That's their question. Is it a function or not? Well, let me give you the simple rule without any good reasons, and then I'll give the reasons later. So first off, here's the rule, the rule for, for an equation. This is maybe what you want to put in your 3 by 5 card. You have a 3 by 5 card, both sides, for the exams, right? You can use and write anything you want on there. So this is probably a good thing to write. Um, if, if there's y squared or y to the fourth or y to the sixth or y to any even power, then it's not a function. Or if you have plus or minus anywhere, that's also not a function. Otherwise, if it doesn't have those two things, it is a function. Now, I haven't given any logic to that. First off, that's just simply the rule. I'll try to make sense of it in a second, but this will be pretty easy. These will be super quick for you. So what I'm saying is all you need to do is just look at what they gave you. Can you all see that? Y equals 2x cubed. And just ask yourself, hey, is that y have an even power on it? Well, no. It's just plain old y, which just means, you know, first power, huh? Doesn't have any even power. Is there a plus or minus anywhere? No. Well, then it's good. Yes. It's a function. And we're done. It's just a yes, no question. So it's yes, and we're done. Next question. So it is that, so now I haven't given reasons, but first off, that is the rule. Y to even power will make it not a function. Plus or minus anywhere will make it not a function, because it'll break that function rule. I'll explain in a minute. Otherwise, if it doesn't have plus or minus, doesn't have Y to an even power, it's a function. So these will be super quick. Let's so is it a function? So y equals 4 over x plus 3. Is it a function? Yes. <laughs> this is super quick. You'll whip over these, right? Doesn't have y squared or any even power. Doesn't have plus or minus. Um, now, now, now maybe it's a good time to say why. why. Why does that matter? Why would something like, I don't know, let me just make one up. y squared equals x. 
Why would that not be a function? Do you see why? Do you see why? If it was a negative, it wouldn't be. Yeah, because remember, the, the function rule is every x has to go to only one y. You could have x be something like 1, and y could be plus or minus 1, for example. Or x could be 4, and y could be plus or minus 2. On and on you go. There is, what, one input going with, with two different outputs, huh? One x going with two different y's. See, when you have the two power or any even power, on the y, that gives you two options for your output with the same x. So that's a no-no. That's breaking the function rule, isn't it? Right? E now, now, why is the even power the deal? Like, why would y to the fourth would be the same issue? But why would it be OK to have, like, y to the third? That would not be a problem. Why? Yeah, because you don't cover up signs, basically, right? Even powers bury negative signs, don't they? Whereas odd powers keep them. And so you won't have the problem, right? In other words, you say, well, yeah, you can just do plus or minus 1. No, you can't, right? x1 would not be true with y negative 1. Not true, right? Negative 1 to the third power, right? Negative 1 to the third power does not equal 1. Only positive 1 to the third power. 1 would only go with 1. It wouldn't go with two things for odd powers. So that's why odd powers are good. They're functions on y. Even powers on y break the rule. And of course, plus or minus, well, I said plus or minus breaks. Well, that's obvious. Not to plus or minus, you get two options. Plus or minus anywhere. That's giving you two options. That breaks the function rule. So that's why those break the function rule. Why, um, how about one other question? Why wouldn't it be a problem if x is square? Why, why are we just doing the y thing? Won't that give two options for x? Yeah, it will. Right, plus or minus. Yeah, but we don't, we don't care about that. We're fine with having two options for your input, for your x. We just don't want two options for your output. That's what the function rule says. All right. So there's the logic behind that. Those will be easy. OK, so now we're plugging into functions. You guys know all about this, right? f of x equals 4x squared plus 3x plus 3. And we're supposed to plug in negative 3. Can you do that real quick? Remember how to plug into a function? When you plug in, put parentheses around what you're plugging in. Like that. So put parentheses around it. Well, I'm supposed to do roll, huh? Maybe I'll do that in a minute. I don't have time for that. <laughs> Minus 9 plus 3. What is that? It's 30? Yeah, I think it's straight 30, huh? Maybe I'll do roll in a minute. I'll probably just forget. Questions on that? That good? Remember about plugging into functions? They're going to get uglier and uglier on that plugging into functions thing. You good so far? We all happy with that? All right. I'm going to move on to another one. I know I'm moving fast, but uh, bless you. Okay, so now f of x is 3x over x squared plus 6. And they want me to plug in negative 2. That's, that part's not bad. So go ahead and plug in negative 2. Notice how, again, I put parentheses. Whenever you plug into a formula, you want to put parentheses around the number you're plugging in. And so what do we get on that one? That would be negative 6, and that'd be 4 over 10. 4 plus 6, 10. And then you have to reduce all fractions. Huh? So just divide top and bottom by 2, negative 3 fifths on that. So that's, that's not a big deal. Let's go on to part B, though. Now they're going to say, what is, part B, what is f of negative x? So how do I do f of negative x? Well, the same way we did f of negative 2. You just, whatever's in the parentheses, that's, that doesn't mean multiply, does it? Right? This, this is a time when parentheses do not mean multiply. They mean plug in, huh? 
This, this is like the holes in the top of a toaster. That's why toaster is my favorite function analogy, because it works, right? It's got the holes even. It's got the insert slot. So that means that negative x is being put in the toaster. It's being put in the function. So you take that negative x, and you just plug it into the function, just like we plugged in the negative 2. So it becomes 3 negative x, let me separate this, over negative x squared plus 6. So just like I plugged in the negative 2, I plug in the negative x. So anything they put in the parentheses, I think you all know that. So negative 3x over what? x squared plus 6. That's as far as we can go. We're done with that one. Is that good? What's that? Uh, the negative squared just becomes positive. Is that all good? Like that. Okay, now part C comes out. So that was part B. I, I, I've seen it. Part C is going to ask us negative f of x, which is not the same as the negative being in the parentheses as we had in part B. So let me give you a second on that one. So negative f of x. See if you know what to do. So here are the negatives outside the toaster, right? It's not being plugged in. So what's that going to do? You take the whole function, which what was the whole original function right here? So 3x over x, oops, x squared plus 6. And I'm supposed to put a negative sign outside, huh? Not plugged in, not in the toaster like part B was, but outside. So where do you put it outside? Do you put it on the top? Do you, do you put it on the bottom? Do you, do you kind of like stick it in the front middle? Are all those okay? Some of those okay? Anybody real confident? I'll tell you two of those were right and one of those was wrong. So when you put a negative, th think about it. I think you know it if you think about it for a second. When you have a negative in a fraction, let's, let's, take, let's take a simple fraction instead of this kind of big ugly one. If I have like just a half, you know, I can put the negative in the top, I can put the negative in the bottom, or I can put the negative in the front. It's all the same. Those are all negative a half, aren't they? Right? Because negative over, that, that, that one doesn't look very clear. Let me write it more clearly. Negative in the top, right? Negative over positive is negative, right? Positive over negative is negative, right? When, when you have one negative sign, with, you know it's negative, and then negative in the front means it's negative. Those are all negative a half. Those are all fine. Top, bottom, front, it's all the same. What's not the same is to put the negative on both. Why is that not the same? That's positive. Two negatives is positive. That actually would be positive. So, as long as you just have one minus sign, top, bottom, or front, it doesn't really matter. It's all good. It's all negative. Now, I said one of those was not the same, though. So what's, what am I talking about? The other thing you have to worry about, so, so what did I just say? I said when you put a negative on the top or on the bottom or in the front, it's all the same. It's all good. It doesn't matter. But if you go to the bottom or the top or whatever, and there's more than one thing down there, it's got to hit all of them. Not just the front, but that was the one that was wrong, huh? So you can take that minus sign and just put it in the front like this right here. That'd be a fine answer. Math Excel knows all this and would say good, good answer. Or you could take that minus sign and you could put it in the top. There's only one term up there, 3x, so that's good. Or if you want to, it'd probably be weird. I mean, you're not going to do it, but it's important to know it for other things we do later when we simplify things, is you could put it on the bottom, but if you put it on the bottom, it's got to go to both. That's also right. That's also true. Now, you probably wouldn't do that. I mean, that'd be a, probably a little strange. So in reality, probably what you're going to do is just stick it in the top or stick it in the front, and that's fine and good. Make sense? Questions on that? Um, where does the negative uh, 3x go? So the original function was just plain 3x, right? Original function they gave me. Okay. And so the negative in the front, I just stuck it in the front. Now, the negative 3x was for the when I plugged negative into the in part B into the function. All right, and then part ooh, D. There's like a part D on this one, I think. Let's go back and look. Okay, so now they're giving me f of x equals 3x over x squared plus 6, and they want f of x plus h. So what do we do? Well, same thing. You know, whatever's in the parentheses, you plug in for it for x. So x plus h, 
x plus h squared plus 6. That good like that? So everywhere you've got x, that's like an insert slot in a toaster, right? Everywhere you've got the x, you plug in whatever you're putting into the toaster, x plus h, x plus h with parentheses around it. Okay, and then we need to distribute here, right? So it's going to become 3x plus 3h on the top. On the bottom, what is, what is here's, here's the part that gets people, if anything's going to get you, it would be right here. What is x plus h squared? Is it x squared plus h squared like that? Is that right? No. no. Make sure you know that. That's really important. You will die. You will not pass math 5A if that kind of thing is. Because if, if that's just indicative that your algebra skills are weak. So, I mean, I mean, at this point, it's okay if you're still doing that, you know. But you need to, by the end of the semester, if you're still doing that, math 5A is not going to happen. So you need to weed that out and, thing, and things like that. You need to rise in your algebra ability. That is not true. So um, what, what is true? Well, you've got to write two of them with the parentheses and FOIL, huh? So x plus h, x plus h, like that. And then you've got to FOIL that whole thing out, you know, and it becomes, I'll go over here, I'm running out of room. It becomes whatever it becomes. So x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus 6, and that's the final answer right there. Is that good? Does that make sense? So keep practicing that algebra stuff. And you, you can master these, all these rules, but it does take some time. Okay, let's go on. So that's all. Okay, so we're going to talk about domain in this question. Okay, so there we go. So they want domain. What, first off, what, is, what does domain even mean? It means allowable x's, x values. Inputs. It mean, means there are certain things you're allowed to plug in to the function and certain things you're not. Kind of like with a toaster, it's always my functionality. There are certain things you shouldn't put in a toaster. You shouldn't put knives in a toaster, right? That's not in the domain of a toaster. Again, the domain is what you should put in. Allowable plugins, right? You should put bread and frozen waffles and things like that, but you should not put knives in the toaster. Right? So that's what they're asking for this function. They've got this function, x squared over 9x squared plus 7, and they're saying, what's the domain? What, what things are allowable to be plugged in? Now, that's kind of a funny question if you think about it. Like, what do you mean? Can't you just plug anything you want in? Any number, I mean? Can't you just put any why, why would any number ever be a problem? You know, what, what are they talking about? What are they getting at? Why would plugging any certain number into that function ever cause a problem? Well, there's two areas where we look for problems. So two problem areas for domain. Number one is denominator not equal to zero and solve. Remember how we can never have the bottom zero? We talked about that, haven't we? The bottom of fraction zero is undefined. It's just craziness. There's no connection to the real world. We can't have that. Uh, number two, right, I, you, you know, you know, like 7 over 0, for example, is undefined. And what we mean, there's no, there's no comparison to the real world, right? Math is supposed to connect to things in the real world. It's supposed to describe things in the real world. Where there's nothing in the real world where you would ever have a 0 at the bottom, right? Because the bottom number is the number you cut it into. Am I, am I making sense? I'm trying to go quick on this. But like if I had one third, what does that mean? I have one pie cut it into three pieces. I had one third of the pie last night. One pie cut in three pieces. So if the bottom number is the cut into number, which it is for the real life meaning of a fraction, what does it mean to cut something into zero pieces? If you don't touch it with a knife, it's one big piece. You can't cut something into zero pieces. That's crazy, right? So that's why we don't like that. We don't like zero in the bottom of a fraction. It's got no definition. It's undefined. Don't confuse that with zero in the top. What's zero in the top? That's just zero. I mean, you could do that. You can say, last night, I had zero sevenths of the pie. Well, that's, that's a weird way to talk. But, but okay, yeah, it's just a weird way to say you had no pie, right? But it's still real. There's still real reality to that. There's no reality to having zero in the pie. You can't do that. So that's why we restrict that. So any x that we would ever plug in to any function that would make the bottom zero, the whole denominator zero, we're going to restrict that. We're going to say, no, no, no. That's like putting a knife in the toaster. Don't do that. 
You can't plug those x's in. The other thing, do you remember we can't have a negative <laughs> square root, a negative inside a square root? Like, what's the square root of negative 4, for example? It's imaginary, huh? Because you, you, you can't, it's not 2, because 2 times 2 is not negative 4. It's not negative 2, because negative 2 times negative 2 is positive. It's not negative 4 either. You can't say, oh, I'll do one negative, one positive, because it's supposed to be the same thing twice. and So that's not allowable. So you just can't do it. It's imaginary. Yeah, you guys know uh, it's 2i, huh? It's imaginary. So no negatives, because we don't want, we don't want to go to the imaginary. We want to stay in the real numbers. So that's the other thing. If you ever have the inside, if you ever have a root, one or two problems down the road, they're going to give us a root symbol. The inside of a two root, uh, you say, well, I'm not writing that very clearly. Let me try again. If they ever give you a two root and they say, and with an inside, you grab out that inside and you say, hey, inside, you cannot be negative. Now, how do you say that in math? How do you say you cannot be negative? If I said, hey, I'm thinking of a number in my head and it's not negative, what does that mean that number is? Zero or positive, right? It's not negative, then it's greater than or equal to zero, huh? That's, that's not negative. And then you solve it. So those are the two trouble spots we look for. We look and we say, hey, do you have a denominator? If so, that denominator cannot, that's a not equal zero, solve it. Do you have any two roots? If so, the inside has got to be greater than or equal to zero. You can't have that. You can't be negative. Yeah? What if it's a cubic root? Yeah, how about that? Good question. So, this, um, so when I wrote the square root of negative 4, I'm saying square root. Whenever you say square, what do you mean? What's this called? x squared. x squared. Huh. So square means 2, right? Square is 2 dimensions. What do we call this when you put a third power on that? x cubed. So cube is a shortcut word for 3 because the cube is 3 dimensional. And square is a shortcut word for 2 because the square is 2 dimensional. It's flat. Right? Okay, so with that in mind, when I call, let me make sure you're clear with this, when I call this guy here a square root, when I say the word square, what am I saying? Two. I'm saying two root. He's a two root. Where's the two? Well, it's understood to be in the hook, isn't it? When there's nothing else showing. It's an understood two, right? And, that, and what, what's the 2 mean? Well, it asks what times itself twice is negative 4, and we know nothing. All right, now, with all that precursor, what about, what about an odd root? Because somebody was asking, it's a good question. What about an odd root? What about a cube root? Because I'm making a big deal about a 2 root being the problem. Why is cube root not a problem? What is the cube root of negative 8? Can you do it? Yeah, it's fine. It's just negative 2. It's not imaginary. It's totally real. It's negative 2, huh? Because negative 2 times itself three times, three negatives would go back to negative 8, wouldn't it? So that's why we have no problem with odd roots. Odd roots are fine. You, you can plug those in all day. There's no problem at all. But even two roots, um, or any other even, they're not going to give us four roots or six roots, but any even root, the inside cannot be negative because that will be a problem. All right, so there's our two issues. So having said all of that, what about this particular function? What does he have? Does he have any roots? No, but he does have a denominator. So let's do his little denominator. Nine, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to take the denominator. What does it say? Denominator and set it not equal to zero and solve. I'm supposed to say, all right, you got a denominator. I don't even care about the numerator. I'm fully ignoring the numerator. It's not a concern to me. I'm just saying, hey, that denominator might be a problem. Let's check it out. The denominator cannot equal zero. Okay, so how do I, so solving a not equals is just like an equals. So let's solve that thing. Let's um, jump the 7 over. 9x squared does not, cannot equal negative 7. Divide by the 9. So x squared is not allowed to equal negative 7 ninths. Good so far? Just trying to solve for x, you know, just trying to find what x value is not allowed. What x value would make that bottom 0. Okay, how do I finish there? I root it, right? And the rooting cancels the squaring, so you get x cannot equal the square root of negative 7 ninths. What's the square root of a negative number? Imaginary. So what does that mean? It's easy to get kind of lost in this. What, what are we saying? We're saying x cannot equal an imaginary number. So, so then there's no real restriction at all. Does that make sense? x cannot be imaginary. Okay, x won't be imaginary. 
That's no restriction, right? It can be any real number. So, right, so x can be any real number number. It can't be imaginary. Who cares? Now, if that had been a positive 7 ninths over there, then I would have said, yeah, you can't equal the square root of 7 ninths. That would have been a restriction. That would have been a real number restriction. But it was negative. So, you know, it's negative 7 ninths. So, that's imaginary. So, it can't be that imaginary number. Well, who cares? It can still be any real number. They want you to answer an in interval notation. Notice. How do you say all real numbers in interval notation? You good with that? Negative infinity to positive infinity. That's the final answer. In other words, we're saying all real numbers, that's a negative infinity there, all real numbers are acceptable. We good with that? That was a lot of talk. It's easier than I'm, I'm probably over talking it. Let's try another one. Okay, so we have 5x over x squared minus 9, and they're asking the, the domain question again. So let me let you give that a try. Find the domain. Roberto is here with us, our class, our ETC tutor. Did you want to give a handout or all information? Uh, yeah, right on the board. Right if you want to yeah, it'd be great. I'll write on the board. So these are the tentative hours for just this week. Uh -huh. For tutoring, uh, for 40, uh, we have two days. So Wednesday from 1 to 3 o'clock. And then we have Thursday from 1 to uh, 2 o'clock. That's just this week, or that's going to be consistent? That's this week, uh, as far as I know. Um, by next week, I should have a more, um, basically more for schedule. But as of right now, that's kind of what we are. 134? Yeah, right there. That's us for Virto this week, so it's day one to three, tomorrow one to two, and might be shifted as we go. So Roberto will be checking in with us, remember, he's our, our, our tutor just for us. All right, so we got to take that, you know, thank you, Roberto. Take that denominator, and x squared minus 9, say, hey, denominator, you cannot equal zero, huh? Bottom of fraction can't be zero, that's not allowed. All right, so how do we solve that thing? Just jump that 9 to the other side. Like it becomes a positive 9, right, when things jump over, change signs. And then, um, what do I do with that, then? Yeah, good. you remember the plus or minus? I'm impressed. Good job. Yeah, remember when you put the root on both sides, you got to do the plus or minus, huh? Because it's really plus or minus 3 squared if it's 9, huh? So, so remember, when you, I always tell my algebra students, when you put, a, I make up goofy analogies, that when you put a roof on the house, you got to go up and down the ladder. It's embarrassing. It's almost... <laughs> But it may be the goofier and the easier to remember. So you've got to remember, because it's easy to forget the plus or minus. When you put a root on both sides, you've got to do the plus or minus or you're missing half the story. Huh? When you put a roof on the house, you've got to you know, up and down. You know, it's goofy. Anyway. Uh, when you put a roof on the house, up and down the ladder. So what do we get? Uh, rooting cancel squaring. Plus or, plus or minus 3. Root of 9 is 3. So x cannot equal plus 3 or minus 3. Either one of those is going to cause a problem, huh? Right? Think, look at the original function. If you plug plus or minus 3 in for x, squared will be 9. Either one, right? Plus or minus 3 squared is 9. Minus 9 makes that bottom 0, huh? So it, it, it chokes the function. It can't do that. Right there, and it just stops dead in its tracks. So you can't have the bottom be 0. So we don't allow that. It's like putting a knife in the toaster. We say, no, 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 no. You can't plug in plus 3 or minus 3. That's not allowed, not equal. Anything else is fine. Any number you want. 10 million, sure, fine, anything, but not plus 3, not minus 3. So how do, we, how do we say that in interval notation? How do we say all the numbers except not negative 3 and not positive 3 in interval notation? I'll put a little hole here at negative 3, a little hole here at positive 3. Everything else is okay. So in other words, all these things are okay, all the things in the middle are okay, and all the things over there are okay. There's three sections of numbers that are okay. How do you say that? Well, this left arrow is negative infinity, and the right arrow is regular infinity. So you say this section, this section, and this section are the OK sections. So you say negative infinity to negative 3, united with negative 3 to positive 3, united with 3 to infinity. Always parentheses on those, because we're never including the, the 3 or the negative 3, huh? 
no brackets. So there it is. It's a complex looking answer. Just to say, it's a complex way to say not anything but three or negative three. Good on that. All right. Okay. So they're going to go f of x equals 8 plus 4x. They're going to start giving us two functions at a time now. g of x is 4 of x. And they're going to want us to, so part a here says f minus g of 1. All right, so what does that mean? That means take the f function, subtract the g function, and when you're done, plug in the 1. Or you can plug in the 1 first. It doesn't really matter. So I'll take the f function minus, oh, wait, I wrote the f wrong, didn't I? You guys got to say something when I do that. Like that, huh? So take the f function, whoops, that's wrong here too. Take the f function, and then minus the g function. So what is that then? Well, these cancel clearly. It's just 8, huh? So f minus g is just h. And um, good so far? So that's f minus g. It's just 8. But notice there's no x anymore. Right? It's just 8, not 8x. Just 8. The, the x stuff dropped out when I subtracted. There's no x at all. What does that mean? It's a toaster with no holes. What can you put in a toaster with no holes? Nothing. So where do I plug in the 1? I don't. There's no holes. There's no x slot. So the answer is just 8. You don't have to do anything with the 1 because there's no longer holes in the toaster. There's no longer an X slot to plug in. Does that make sense on that? The X has vanished, then you don't do the plug in. If there was an X still there, like it was 8 plus X or something, then I would put the 1 in and get 9 or, you know, whatever. You're supposed to do the 1 at the end. It's just we didn't have any holes anymore on that. That was a 2. Yeah, no, <laughs> good question. Exactly. Well, what would, what, what's F minus G of 2? 8. doesn't matter. F minus G of a million. 8. Right. But not here. But not here. Okay. Yeah, no, these parentheses do not mean multiply. They mean plug in. Yeah, so it's just 8 every. It's not multiply at all. Yeah, because if you think multiply, you're going to think wrong. Because you think, well, times 2, that should be 16. It's not times. This is the whole of the two. Yeah, so really good question. Parentheses with functions do not mean multiply. You've got to be crystal clear on that in your mind. They mean plug in. They do not mean multiply in that setting. All right. So, um, yeah, I think it's bad notation. I think math should have come up with something else because we're so used to parentheses being multiply, huh? I think it would have been better if they would have come up with another plan. Uh, anyway, but so you guys got to keep reminding yourself, parentheses don't mean multiply when I'm talking about functions. Okay, now here's the tricky question I, I really wanted to show you about. They're going to ask what the domain of f minus g is. And we were doing domain a minute ago, you know. So, um, so, so what, what is f minus g? Well, f minus g, we just, it's 8, right? It's just 8. We just did it. f minus g is just 8. Not, no, no plug in, no 1, or, and just, just f minus g in general. Okay, well, it's 8. So remember what we learned about domain. What did we learn about domain? You look for two trouble spots. And if those aren't there, everything's fine. Those aren't there. Right. What are the two trouble spots? Denominator? Well, we don't, it's not eight. We don't have any denominators. Um, right? Denominators can't be there, but we don't have it done. Um, what's the other one? Square roots. Inside of a square root, it's got to be not negative. We don't have any square roots. So we don't have any problems. We would like to say everything is okay, but that will be wrong. Here, there's, there's a little trick on this one. This is actually 8 plus 4x minus 4x, isn't it? That's really what f minus g is. There's f, there's g, huh? Yeah, but those cancel, and it's just 8. Well, <coughs> that's what they told you in algebra. Algebra is over now, and it's time to think a little more maturely as you move into pre-calc and calc. These cancel sort of. Not really. Not in all situations. We'd like to say, that's just 8. What do you mean, Mr. Aaron? That's just 8. Not, not, not totally. Close to 8, but not always. What am I talking about? Well, just reason with me logically. Two things, this and this, are really equal. I'm saying they're not 
always equal. Two things are really equal if they're equal for every x value you could plug into them, right? Like, like if I said 2x equals x plus x. That's true. That's always true. Oh, you read it here. 2x is x plus x. Plug any x you want. Plug 10 in there and 10 in there. 2 times 10 is 20. 10 plus 10 is 20. Equal, yeah. For every x value you want to plug in, 2x does equal x plus x. That's 100% always true. These guys are not 100% always equal. They're usually equal. They're almost always equal, but not always always. When, are, when does this not really equal a? For what x value? Zero. Put zero in. He's got to... Or he's got no problem. I'm not choking. i got no place to plug the x in. I'm still a, and I'm choking. They're not the same. Always, always, are they? So what does that mean? Whenever you do domain, when they're like adding functions or subtracting or doing something fancy, you have to answer the domain question before the simplification. Am I making sense? So domain before simplification. Before simplifying, it's really this. And so what's the domain of that? That's the real f minus g. Well, that's got a denominator problem, right? What, what do we learn about? You've got to take the denominator, which is x, and same thing twice, and say denominator, u cannot equal 0, right? That's not allowed. That denominator cannot be 0. So that's, a, that's the domain. The domain can't be zero. Even though those cancel out, they don't really, right? Not really. So the answer then is negative infinity to zero united with zero to infinity, right? Because it's everything except not zero. Everything here, everything there, right? So there's the interval notation answer that basically says everything but zero. That's the real answer. So the moral of the story, did you catch it? If you're combining functions in any way, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, whatever, and they ask you about domain, you've got to do the domain question before simplification to get the real answer. Okay, so on this one, they're asking us for, that's called the difference quotient. Let me, let me just be clear with no secrets. On exam number one for sure. So you can count on it, absolutely. I'll put one of those. And the reason is because it's the first thing you do in Math 5A, calculus. It's the thing you do right off the bat is you use that difference quotient on some functions. So I want to make sure I help you prepare for that. So um, how do we do it? Well, let's do it in parts. First off, they're asking for f of x plus h. So how do we find f of x plus h? we do for that? Yeah, we plug it in. So um, to the original function, x plus h squared minus 4x plus h plus 7. Is that making sense so far? I'm plugging into the function x squared minus 4x plus 7. I plugged in x plus h. Let's work that out now. So can I skip steps here a little bit? When you FOIL this out, you're going to get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared, right? And then distribute here, minus 4x minus 4h plus 7. That good to there? Oh, boy, we're out of time, aren't we? I can't believe how fast that time went. I didn't even finish 2-1. This is getting crazy. I'm getting further behind. All right. I'm going to have to make a major shift in the way I do lecture. I'm covering way too many problems and not getting it done. All right, 2-1 will not be due until Monday. I'm going to have to put off 2-1. I'm going to have to finish it. I'm going to have to hit the accelerator. So I don't know if you felt I was going fast. I'm going to have to go way faster. I'm falling way behind our calendar. So I'm just doing too many problems. I'm going to skip around more. All right, guys, we will stop there. I'll quit my complaining. We will stop there.